This is a screencast of the talk I'll be giving on Friday um, at a seminar um, at the University of Southampton where I'm visiting Honora Smith. Um, the title of the talk is The Price of Anarchy and Hierarchical Cues um, Using a Particular Approach, the Unobservable Approach. What I'll be talking about is uh, routing games. Um, firstly, I'll give an introduction to routing games. I'll motivate the problem and then discuss how I extend Pigou's example, which is a well-known example in the field, show my results, and importantly, this is very much ongoing work. I've only kind of just gotten started with this, so I will talk about um, uh, where I plan on going. So, a routing game is defined... Um, Need to define a routing game, one needs a graph, which is defined using um, the vertex set and the edge set. Uh, the graph has a set of source sync pairs, um, so where stuff goes from and where it goes to, and the stuff is a certain amount of commodities. And then we have a certain amount of traffic, um, that, which is the amount of stuff that has to go from each of those um, sources to sinks. And then what we have here is this PI is the set of paths that are available to each commodity, so the choice is available to it, so the amount of ways you can get from A to B. To differentiate the ways, um, we use what are called latency functions. So on every edge, we associate a particular um, function, and we, we have these um, not too restrictive assumptions on these functions. So firstly, that they're non-negative. Secondly, continuous, that uh, they're convex and non uh, decreasing. The first three, hopefully, you'll allow me to simply say are a question of um, scale. And the last one simply means that we're modeling situations in which uh, congestion is a negative thing. So cost increases um, as congestion increases. And then we have this expression for the cost of a flow. Um, so this is a famous example. I always regret saying something's famous and then having to describe it, because um, obviously not famous enough. A well-known example in the, in the field of routing games called Pigou's example. And it's, it's defined on this extremely simple graph where we have a certain amount of traffic, one, it's a continuous amount of traffic, uh, one unit of it, that can go from, that needs to go from A to B. And it can go in one of two ways. It can either go along this top road here, let's call it a big highway, and no matter how many people choose to use that highway, um, it'll take them an hour to get to work. Or there's this way here, it's a little shortcut, and the congestion is, um, the amount of time, sorry, it takes to use this route is um, equal to the, uh, the the fraction of traffic they use it. So if half the people use the top route and half the people use the second route, then um, the people using the second route, it'll take them half an hour to get across. If 75% um, of the people use the second route, it'll take them 45 minutes to get across. Using this, we can quickly write down the, the expression for the optimal flow. And it's a very simple exercise to realize that it's optimized if half people use the first um, highway and half people use the second highway. So the optimal uh, average uh, commute or average cost is 45 minutes. But of course, it's immediate to realize that the half of people that are on this highway looking across at the people on this shortcut realize, well, actually, if I nip across, I'll only have just a little bit more than half an hour's commute. And using that reasoning very quickly, we see that the Nash flow, so the game theoretical flow, um, is 0, 1. So with no people taking the first uh, route and everyone taking the second route, and eventually everyone having an hour's commute anyway. Um, so then there's these two very powerful results, and I'm not going to dwell on them too much, but what they basically show is that um, if you have a given routing game defined by, by, the, the, by this triplet, and you replace all the costs with the, the marginal cost, which is defined like this, so it's equal to the actual cost plus a little bit, and if you find the Nash flow for this new game, then that's equal, that's actually equivalent to the optimal flow for the original game. And then equivalently, there's another result that says if we have F tilde, which is the Nash flow for a given game, then it will minimize this um, function. So in effect, what we're saying is that a Nash flow and an optimal flow mathematically are, are not different. Um, they're, they're the same thing. 
So just revisiting Pigou's example, the exact same example, um, we can calculate this optimal function, which was the, the previous function um, on the previous slide. And we, we get this function here for this particular example. And uh, that is optimized by 0, 1, which is the Nash flow. Okay. So what that means is that we can turn uh, a game theoretical problem into an optimization problem and vice versa. So that becomes very, very handy later on. And now getting to this definition of price of anarchy, um, it was uh, a measure um, defined in 1999, um, and it's basically a measure of how bad a system is if you remove central control. So the optimal cost by definition is optimal, the Nash cost will be worse, worse sorry, and so uh, how worse. And so for Pigou's example, if you remember, the optimal um, cost was uh, three quarters of an hour, the Nash cost was an hour, so the price of anarchy is one over three-fourths, which is four-thirds. Um, so in my previous work, I had looked at uh, whales, and I would uh, um, identified certain hospitals um, and uh, certain um, demand nodes uh, for, for a particular surgery, for elective knee surgery over a certain time period. We had a certain amount of service nodes, certain amount of demand nodes. And I gave a general model a general routing game model that takes into account the choices that could be made uh, by patients when choosing between healthcare facilities. So we have the certain amount of uh, demand nodes, certain amount of hospitals, but uh, and then we have the distances, because obviously patients are going to take into account distances. What they also take into account is the waiting time at a hospital. So waiting lists are, can be a problem in healthcare, and so how long the waiting list is going to be is going to be um, one of these uh, costs on an, on, a, on an arc. But of course, we've only got a certain amount of, we have these M sources, and we've only got one sink. And that's because a sink doesn't necessarily represent a hospital. Well, it doesn't represent a hospital. It represents a, a change of state. So you're in the state of having to make a decision, and you go to the state of the decision being made. Um, what I add to the model is that I allow for patients to bulk. So if the cost here is simply too high, then they might exit the system. So they'd exit the system, and again, to go back to the healthcare example, that could be um, exiting the system uh, to go to a private healthcare facility or perhaps just living with a lower quality of life by not getting your knee replacement for you. Um, so I solved this model for, for various uh, parameters. And what we got here is the price of anarchy graphed against the demand. So as the demand for service increases, and what we graphed it was for various values of this cost of bulking. Um, and what you see is this pattern here where we have this high price of anarchy at a certain amount of demand. And basically what's happening around here is that as the demand increases, the system's no good. The system can't cope with the demand, so it doesn't really make a difference whether or not choice is offered. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, the actual demand was around this point here, which you can see is pretty high. So moving on to the current work, so hierarchical queuing models. What you um, have here and often happens is you might have, in green here, I've got the demand nodes, and all these demand nodes will could possibly go see a community center or a general, general practitioner. Um, and before going through these community centers, sorry, before getting to the hospital, they would have to go through these community centers. Um, here's just another picture. And, what might happen is you have a multi-entry multi system um, with choice where people could choose to enter the system at various levels of the hierarchy. Now, the reason I'm putting up this slide um, is because uh, the, the person I'm visiting to give this talk to, um, Honor Smith, is actually the, the first author on this, on this paper. Um, Professor Harper now is at, um, well, is at Card Cardiff University. Uh, uh, I do a lot of work with him as well. So um, this is some work they've done looking at um, hierarchical location models. And so I, I, I'm looking at this as well. So if we remember Pigou's example, this is the, uh, the model that we've already looked at. Um, what we're doing now is we're going to generalize that. And so extend what we have there is the old Pigou's example, and now we're just adding this arc to it. And so what's happening is there there. Whereas, if I, if I go back to the previous slide, in this slide, if we think about what we're looking at, we ultimately have either to seek service at a level that, that is increased by congestion or to bulk. 
we now have two of those decisions, where our first decision is to take the shortcut, so skip this level of hierarchy that will that will uh, suffer from congestion, and then go to the second um, second hierarchical level that also suffers congestion, or that is the third choice, which is to to um, completely skip the entire system. And for for ease of notation, uh, obviously there's a lot more variables now. Um, we have these two variables here, which are x1, so the amount of people that uh, bulk the entire system, and x2, the amount of people that take the shortcut um, at a cost of alpha. Um, and then obviously this 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 value here is simply 1 minus x1, and then this value here is 1 minus x1 minus x2. So first of all, uh, what I've spent some time doing is identifying the value at which alpha makes this a redundant game. Because um, if, if alpha is too high and has to be above this particular level, um, then no one will ever take the shortcut. Okay, so in other words, you can identify the level at which um, the shortcut makes sense. Okay, uh, that's not, not too tricky um, a problem. But it allows us to then give expressions for the uh, the Nash um, flow, so to solve the game, basically, um, and it depends on this particular cost, uh, this particular uh, boundary uh, level here. And then what we can do is use uh, those powerful results from from earlier on that shows that a Nash cost and an optimal cost are are, are basically the same thing, and get the um, the expression for the x stars. Uh, these should be uh, x1 star and that should be x2 star. Um, and so here's just some graphs um, of x1 and x2. So in red is the quantity of traffic that um, that bulks the entire system. Um, the dashed line is the Nash flow and the total line and the, the solid line is the optimal flow. And so we we see that um, the optimal flow is always higher than the Nash flow. So that's basically saying the entire system is busier uh, when individuals um, act selfishly. Okay, and that's that's a general thing that occurs in routine game theory and behavioral games, um, where you, you do see that in individuals um, make systems busier. But then I was kind of hoping to see if I could get something similar for the, the second um, uh, the second um, arc, so the amount of people that take the shortcut. And I'll just flick through the slides here. Um, so you see that is for uh, a particular cost. So as I change the costs, the, the two red lines always stay in the same um, uh, point, one across the other, um, whereas the, uh, the blue ones seem to, to have differing. Um, behaviors. So it doesn't seem that there's anything that interesting to say about the blue ones. So what? What's the point of all this? Well, um, the, the system is busier. I've said that. Okay. And um, and then you've got to wonder is how, what does the effect of the shortcut have on it? Um, so, so how much busier? What, what's the problem with this? And that's where the price of anarchy comes in. So we, the price of anarchy is simply the, the ratio of these two costs. Um, and what we have for this value of alpha, if alpha is, so this is the general picture here, if, if alpha is zero, then um, no one will ever take this route here and everyone will take that route. And so basically we've got this picture here. Um, and so this is the value of the initial service or the value of the shortcut. If it's one, um, then no one will ever use it, right? It's just too high, it never makes sense because you'll have to add on the cost C2. So you basically got this. So what we have um, going in this game is we're in fact going in between two Pigou's examples. Okay, so it's interesting to know uh, which one is worse. How, how does how, what are the extreme values of this alpha? Because it's uh, it's well understood that in general Pigou's uh, example shows a very high level of price anarchy. And so what I've graphed here is um, the price anarchy for various linear sorry uh, polynomial polynomial cost functions. For example, C1 is just x, whereas C2 is varying um, varying powers of x. 
So that's x1, x squared, x cubed, x, x um, to the fourth, etc. And what we see for all of these is that as alpha increases to 1, the price of anarchy um, decreases. So to go back to this previous slide, it seems that this is the occasion that gives us the highest price of anarchy. In other words, the value where, where um, there is no shortcut, sorry, where the shortcut is free, and that's the highest price of anarchy, and where you have very high uh, shortcut, then you have um, this, uh, this lower price of anarchy. Okay, so what I've plotted there are these points, um, which are those, you know, I've already talked about them, those boundary points, the point at which um, the shortcut no longer makes sense. And I, I thought I'll just get Sage um, to, um, uh, to try and fit lines to it um, and to see if anything interesting happened. But as you'll see as I, I go through various values, the fits start getting worse and worse. And so we just see the same behavior. It just seems that it's going to take longer to get to 1. Um, and there you go. So these fits no longer work. So just ignore them. But overall, we see that that same that same uh, behavior. In other words, that the lowest price of anarchy is at this boundary point. The price of anarchy chain doesn't change anymore afterwards. Um, and so that that I was able to to show to to show this. Um, and so when the value of initial short service, so when the value of the shortcut is insignificant, that's when the lowest price of anarchy occurs. Right, so um, that that gives you as basically the, the upper boundary at which you should place your price, your you should value this shortcut. Okay, because lower values of the shortcut will increase the price of anarchy, so it will increase the detrimental effect of uh, individual behavior. But um, you can increase it up to a certain point. You can increase it more. You can make it uh, irrelevant, so non-existent. But you can still make it there such that it has a, a reduced um, Effect. The proof is is uh, just requires a little bit of algebra. It's one of those proofs that um, you know you just write down a whole bunch of math for a whole bunch of time, and then eventually it pops out. Um, by design, the the Nash uh, cost is always one, and um, so we only need to consider the um, the optimal cost. Differentiate it with respect to alpha. You get an expression like this. A little bit of work that reduces to this expression here. And you can immediately see that, that um, if we differentiate that a second time, it will be negative. So we have a graph that's just going uh, down all the time. And so there's a single point at which this equates to zero. And simply substituting that in gives the, the result. So that's, that's quite nice. Um, and that's more or less everything I have to show. So what we've done is quantify the effect of individual behavior in the hierarchical queuing systems. They're busier, and we've shown this lowest value of the shortcut, um, so as to, to 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 not have a high price of anarchy. Um, so how can this be used? Using system design, uh, that's the idea. So so when trying to think about taxing a shortcut or or, or whatnot, the, trying to figure out how to minimize the effect of selfish behavior. Um, ongoing, I had a few of these running um, running earlier on today. Um, takes a while to get some of these graphs, obviously. Um, seeing the effect of demand. So as demand increases, how does the price of anarchy increase? So at the moment, I've just got uh, that single unit uh, of demand going through. Um, but now if I say, well, as demand increases, what happens? So what we're beginning to see there is just simply a system that's bad, so it doesn't cope with demand, so the price of anarchy decreases. And what we have here and here are these two optima. These two points relate to points at which you stop walking from the system. You get similar graphs for various values. Um, as I said, this is ongoing work. I like to have uh, apply it to a healthcare case study. So, so use uh, some healthcare data. Um, now, when looking at these types of problems, so queuing problems with um, individual behavior, there are two ways of doing it: uh, using an unobservable approach, which is to use a routing game, or an observable approach, and um, so I'd like to study this using a Markov decision process, which is the observable process. Um, and uh, a very good student of mine, uh, Rob Schoen, has done a lot of work on this uh, in, in more complex models than the ones I need. Um, and in fact, he'll be presenting the seminar uh, at the seminar as well on uh, in Southampton. Another one is a simulation approach. Um, and for that, I've got, uh, hopefully, an extremely talented um, undergraduate student to do some research with me over the summer, and his, his name is Jason Young. 
and he'll be um, he'll be building the simulation model to look at similar problems. And I always like to finish my talks with a little cartoon. So if anyone has any questions, uh, this is where they get to ask. Them.